Hello, Eric King coming to you once again from Nugget of Truth and the Shepherd's Way. Today, if you have your Bibles, again, we're going to be looking at some very, a very deep topic today, actually. We're going to be studying another eschatological subject or theological subject that has to do with prophecy. Now, we have our Bibles, and there's 66 books in our Bible, in our Christian Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We have other studies that show how the Bible actually came together. The last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation, written by the Apostle John on the island of Patmos in his latter years of life, around between 95 and 96 AD. John was already very old when he wrote that, that last letter, and it became the last book of the Bible, almost two centuries after John went to be with our Lord. So we have almost 200 years before the final canonization of Scripture started to really come together. And so, um, we want to discuss, is the Bible itself, the canonized Bible, prophesied in Scripture? Is it mentioned in Scripture? In order to do this, we're going to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. We're going to do more talks, hopefully, on this, because it contains a lot of detail. But it's very important for us to understand this, because we believe in sola scriptura. In other words, the Scriptures alone, the canonized Scriptures. Canonized means books that were put in the canon. The canon being the entire Bible. And so certain letters were accepted over the years, and then finally the canon was closed, and it became what is known as our Christian Bible. So the question today is, is there references that the Bible itself is going to be, come forth and be the Word of God for us here in these days, especially in these last times? And I'm going to tell you that here at the ancient Antiochian church, we teach theology from where it first started, where they were first called Christians in Antioch. Um... And, and we historically document the earliest teachings of the church. So it's very important for you to understand this because many denominations and other churches are not teaching this properly. And I want you to understand it today because it's edifying and it's important. Now, going to the book of Revelation again, John, the Apostle John, in his older years, writing the very last book of, our, of the Holy Scriptures, of the Bible, of our Bibles. He says in Revelation chapter 5, he sees the Lord in a vision... And so we're starting at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. He says, John, that is, the apostle, he says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Now, we have to realize they didn't have books back then. They wrote on parchment paper. Uh, they wrote on scrolls. Now, legal documents were written on scrolls, and then they were sealed with wax stamps. In other words, they would drip... A hot drop of wax on the scroll and then stamp that wax while it was still hot with a family crest or a family seal or a government seal or, or a governor seal or something uh, that showed that the person that sealed it was the person in authority to seal that scroll making it a legal document and usually there would be one open copy that they could reference and then there was the sealed copy the protected copy now, what we have to understand is that title deeds, a title deed is um, when you buy land, you, you, receive, you received a title deed which showed who the previous owners were, the condition of the property, perhaps money that was put into the property and the history of the property and things of this nature were in the, the, the title deed. And the title deed also gave inheritance uh, rights, um, kind of like a will. Um, when you give a will to somebody, you, you write what you want to happen after you after you die. And so the title deed is kind of the same back then. It was sealed. And then family members had the right after that person died, other family members had the right to purchase that title deed or that the deed of that land and become the owners of that land. And so we're talking here about a legal document when we read Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1 where he's, Jesus, where Apostle John sees in vision then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll. Of course, that would be God sitting on the throne with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. It's a legal document. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because... No one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Now, why does the Apostle John weep? 
because, brothers and sisters, according to his culture and time, he knew exactly what that document was. It was, in fact, the title deed to this planet. Now, when you bought a title deed off of a family member before they died, when you were purchasing a land um, from a family member, you were called the Redeemer, or the Kinsman Redeemer. And, of course, we find that mentioned in the, the book of Ruth, the Kinsman Redeemer um, purchases land there, and he's actually referred to as uh, the kinsman redeemer uh, in the book of Ruth. We find that in the book of Ruth is a small book. It's uh, it's after the book of Judges in the in the Old Testament, and we find in Ruth chapter four uh, verses two uh, through four. Uh, of the kinsman redeemer purchasing a property suggests that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and the presence of the elders of my people. Uh, verse 3, then he said to the kinsman redeemer, the one who is going to purchase the land. So if you read Ruth chapter 4, you'll kind of get an idea of the cultural setting of, of what, it, what it meant to, to buy a property deed. Now another scripture I want to look at is that confirms this for us is, is Jeremiah chapter 32. Now, of course, Jeremiah was a prophet, and he was warning Israel that they were about ready to be taken into captivity. And, but eventually, God promised, even through all the captivity, they would receive the promised land. And in order for God to, to make a point of this, he actually informed Jeremiah to buy uh, property uh, off of, a, off of a Hanamel. We read this in Jeremiah chapter 32, and let's start at verse 8. Then, just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel, that is Jeremiah's cousin, came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, Buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right to redeem. In other words, it was Jeremiah's right to be a kinsman redeemer because this property was in uh, his family line. Knowing that they're going to go into Babylonian captivity, and Jeremiah would probably never see the land again, God instead still told him, buy the land. It, it was a sign that, yet yeah, you will still receive this promised land in the future. So, I knew that this was the word of the Lord, Jeremiah says. Verse 9, So I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamil and weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver. I signed the sealed copy, or the sealed deed, that's the scroll that would have the, the seals on it, uh, had it witnessed and weighed and out and the silver uh, on scales, and he purchased it. I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy. So once again, we find that a title deed had, was a sealed a document, and then there was a copy that was open to reference. And I gave this deed to Baruch, son of Neriah, the son of uh, ma si aya in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, and of the witnesses who had signed the deed, and of the Jews sitting in the courtyard. In, verse thirteen. In the presence I gave, in their presence I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says: Take these documents, the sealed copy, the sealed deed, and the unsealed copies of the deed of purchase and put them in a clay jar so they will be last so that they will last a long time for this is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says houses fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land so he was telling Jeremiah to go ahead and buy it and that even though there was going to be times of captivity they would indeed receive that land again according to Adonai's promise so God told him to go ahead and purchase this title deed which he did, the land, and he got the sealed copy and the open copies. And then he was told to put them in a clay jar, preserve them in a clay jar. Now when we read scripture, there are references to Israel being the clay jar, and even us earthen human vessels being made from the dust of the earth. We are like clay jars in the hands of the potter, it says in scriptures, and that God is the potter and the former of those vessels. So we see that the, the sealed copy and the unsealed copy are put in this clay jar. In other words, as Christians, we have to receive this written document inside of ourselves, both uh, physically, the sealed copy, and the unsealed copy. Uh, we have to live it out 
in our lives. So we go back to Revelation chapter 5, where John sees sitting on the throne a God holding a, a, a scroll written on both sides. This denotes the Old and New Testament, sealed with seven seals. Now, of course, we know that Jesus redeemed us. Jesus is called the Redeemer, so he purchased this title deed at Golgotha, at the cross. When he gave his last breath and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and he said, It is finished. He purchased the title deed of this planet, the title deed of this planet, Earth. Now again, title deeds contain the history of, of the property, what went into the property, past and previous owners, and a lot of things like that, and, and the promises of that property to family members and other things. It was a legal document. Now, John wrote this before the Bible was put together. This is the last um, letter written in the book of our Holy Scriptures by the Apostle John, once again around 95, between 95 and 96 AD. And there wasn't a codified Bible in written form until almost 200 years after the Apostle John, or two centuries after the Apostle John. So may I suggest to you here that John is seeing a vision, a future vision that the Bible would be complete. The sealed copy, the perfect copy, is, in, is, is being held by the Lamb of God, Jesus the Christ. The open copy is our Holy Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. And we're going to find that the only one that can open this for us properly, and the only one that can explain this to us property, properly, is in fact Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lamb of God. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 3. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. Now John is seeing this scroll and he says that, that, that no one in heaven, no angelic being, no created being in heaven is worthy to, to open this title deed uh, to planet earth. And no one under the earth, no one in Hades or in hell is uh, qualified to open this book, uh, to scroll or even to look inside of it. I wept, verse 4, Revelation chapter 5, verse 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. The only one that could would be the one that has the right to purchase that scroll to be the kinsman redeemer, the one that could pay the price for the title deed of planet Earth. Revelation 5 and verse 5, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, John. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw the Lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll, the title deed to planet Earth, and to open its seals. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. There it is. Revelation 5 and verse 9. This is a purchased title deed, brothers and sisters. You are worthy because you purchased us. You have made them to be king, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And where will they reign? What did he purchase? He repurchased the earth. And they will reign on earth. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. Showing that by his life, death, and resurrection, he purchased the title deed so he's worthy to open it, because he purchased us. And he purchased it, and it's a title deed to this earth, and that is why you have made them to be king, a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Now, we can say that long ago, Adam and Eve forfeited the title deed. Adam and Eve were given a chance to represent the human race, and they were given laws to obey. They, saw, they decided to disobey that law, and they ate from the wrong tree, and they brought sin, the consequence of sin, into the world. 
Now we're going to find that when Jesus begins to open these seals to us and explain the revelation of, of this title deed, the Bible, to us, Satan has a conniption fit. When, when Adam and Eve forfeited the title deed by sinning, the title be, deed remained in the hands of the fallen one. And the fallen one, of course, is Satan the devil, and he is called, in the scriptures, he is called um, uh, the god of this world or the god of this age. Satan, in fact, is the one controlling this fallen world uh, within limits, but he is the god of this world. We read in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled or hid, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Once again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses uh, 3 through 5, says that in fact the one who currently uh, is running this earth is the God of this world, Satan the devil, and uh, he holds the, the title deed per se, though Jesus has purchased it back, and Jesus is waiting to open it and reclaim it until the last Gentile is saved. When all those during this church age are called into the kingdom that will be called into the kingdom, into the kingdom, and when the kingdom is complete, then in fact, this church age will close. This church age will close, and Jesus will then open up that final copy of the seven sealed scroll, the perfect Bible in heaven. And when he does that, when he opens each seal, the devil throws a fit on earth because he knows that Jesus Christ is getting ready to return. So we have to understand that right now, people are preaching a false gospel, and the false gospel is what happens when Jesus opens the first seal. We're going to read about that. And a white horse goes out, conquering and to conquer. Now, this horse is not Jesus Christ. We're going to find out who this horse is. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, John continuing in this revelation of the seven-sealed scroll, elucidates for us, explains for us what's going on. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals of that title deed. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now it's interesting that John, the apostle, is already there with this angel that's revealing uh, this vision to us. So when the angel, when he hears uh, the, the four, one of the four living creatures say with a loud thunder, Come! It's the, the come is not he's not telling John to come, he's telling the horse to come. He, he says, John, watch this. And he says, Come forth. And then John says, I saw what came forth. It was a white horse. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, without getting into a lot of detail here, we have to understand that only Jesus Christ can open up these seals to us. That no one in heaven or on earth or nor under the earth is able to open this scroll. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. John wept, but then he found out he didn't have to weep anymore because behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is now opening up these scriptures for us the canonized scriptures, and he's revealing to us the plan of redemption, starting with the first dispensation of Adam and Eve, and he begins to unroll this scroll and open it to our eyes. Only Jesus can open the seven-sealed scroll. Only Jesus can open the Bible. Only Jesus can give us proper revelatory understanding of this book. Now, when he opens up the first seal, he sees a white horse. Now, this is an introduction to the beginning of the tribulation period. Now, we have to understand that these, we're going to talk about the four horsemen in another study, but the, each, the first four seals are four horsemen. And these four horsemen represent uh, the, the undulations and waves of Antichrist power coming, into our, coming onto planet Earth. So, in one sense, we could say that this first horse, this false Christ, he began riding way back in the Garden of Eden. 
when Adam and Eve forfeited the title deed, brothers and sisters, they sinned. And so this false Christ then started riding and, 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 and gaining the upper hand because sin and death had entered the world. And we find when we get to the second horse, it's the red horse, the horse of, of death and, and war and murder. We know that shortly after Adam and Eve sinned, the first murder was Cain and Abel. Cain murdered his brother Abel. That was the first murder on this planet. And so the second horse followed. And we can find that each one of the seven seals, these, these seals overlap. They've been going on. But there will be one final opening of, the, of this when Jesus opens up his copy in heaven. It's being unfolded to us now as Jesus is revealing us the scriptures and what they mean and what they understand. As a matter of fact, the, the tribulation, um, the, the seven-sealed scroll is actually outlined by Jesus Christ in his own words in Matthew 24. I want you to go there if you have your Bibles. And we're going to let Jesus open up these seals for us. He's the only one worthy to open up these seals for us. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, we know that the, the, his followers, his closest apostles, the twelve, and other disciples, they came to him. And they asked, when is this great tribulation going to start, Lord? When is, the, when is the end of the end going to happen? So, they're on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, when Jesus is talking to them here, it's documented that he's on the Mount of Olives. And he begins to discuss with them uh, in, in, in order the events that are going to unfold in the, in the latter days. So because he gave this talk on Mount Olives and he discussed with them what was going to happen, it has popularly become known amongst theologians as the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse. That's a poetic, fancy way of saying that this is how Jesus responded to, to them on Mount Olives in regards to what's going to happen in the last days. So in Matthew 24, we have recorded the Olivet Discourse. Jesus says that this is the first thing that's going to happen. And this corresponds with the seven seals. Notice, Matthew 24 and verse 4. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So that's the first sign Jesus mentions, a false Christ. The first seal is this false Christ. I watched the Lamb open the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a, in a voice like thunder, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Jesus says during the tribulation, the first thing, the first seal, Jesus says, Watch out that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now we know it is true that Jesus does finally come riding on a white horse. That's at the end of the tribulation in Revelation 19. And he's not depicted like this horse. The crown that this horse is given is a, a, is a crown made of wreaths. It's a Stephanos or a cross uh, or a, a crown uh, given to competitors in competition. The crown that Jesus wears in Revelation 19 on a white horse is a diadema. It's a crown with, uh, of gold with many layers on it. And this false Christ uh, in Revelation 6 in the first seal, he doesn't have a sword, he has a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows. So he has a soft crown with a bow. He's riding on a white horse, going forth conquering and conquer in, in the name of false spirituality. He's got a false Christianity that he's offering. Jesus again says, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Jesus comes back with the diadema crown, dressed in white garments, with blood splashed on him, and a sword coming out of his mouth, which is the word of God. That's the true white horse. And that comes at the end of the revelation. We have to remember here that when John is receiving this revelation, he's up there with Jesus, and Jesus is showing him things, future things that are going to occur on earth. So this white horse is not Jesus. Jesus is, is in fact the one revealing to John, look, this is what's going to happen when the church is harpazo, when the church is caught up. This is what's going to happen. So, again, Jesus is unlocking these seals for us. Jesus says in Matthew 24, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. 
Now notice in Matthew 24, the second thing Jesus says is going to occur. He says in verse 6, Then you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So the second thing Jesus says is going to occur in Matthew 24, after he warns about the false Christ, he says the second thing that's going to occur is in verse 6. And, and in verse 6, he warns us of war. Now, back in Revelation, when the second seal of that title deed is open, when the Lamb opened the second seal, Revelation 6, 3, I heard the sound, the second living creature say, Come, he's calling a horse. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to, to, uh, to slay men. To him was given a large sword. Now, we know from reading the book of Daniel that when the Antichrist first conquers, he's going to do it through peace. He's going to do it through diplomacy. It says that when that final Antichrist appears, he's going to use diplomacy and peace. He comes depicted as a rider of peace on a white horse. He has a bow showing that he has military authority, but he doesn't use it at first. This white horse comes with a false gospel. This white horse is riding now even, but he will have one final ride when the final Antichrist appears. But as Christians, we understand, in fact, that these four horsemen have been riding for quite some time. But it's going to escalate, and they will have one final ride once the church is harpazo, once the church is raptured. But we see this white horse right now going forth conquering to conquer. Again, he started riding that horse after Adam and Eve sinned, and he's been the god of this world. And he's been trying to establish a false peace and a false religion. He's going to use religion to do it. Now, we read in the book of Daniel that this Antichrist is going to set up ten confederated kingdoms. Three of those kingdoms are going to disagree with him, and he has to war with them and conquer them in order for all ten to be in agreement. We have other studies on this, but this is also an apocalyptic reality uh, um, for us in the last days recorded in the, in the apocalyptic book of Daniel. But we know that in order for him to, to uh, conquer those three out of the ten that are going to disagree with him, he's going to have to go to war. That's why the second horse, when the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. That means he has global power. Now, again, Jesus says in Matthew 24, you will hear of wars, rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. In other words, this second horse has been riding uh, since Adam and Eve sinned. There's always been wars. Such things must happen, Jesus says, but the end is yet to come. In other words, there's a final riding of this horse that has not yet happened. It will happen during the Great Tribulation. But as Christians, we're to be aware that all four of these horses have been riding for quite some time. Jesus says, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, he's talking about world war there. Now, we know, we know that we've had the first round, World War I and World War II. We've had the first couple rounds of, of kingdom against kingdom and nation against nation. I also want to say that when he says nation against nation, uh, the actual Greek there is ethnos against ethnos, which is race against race. Jesus predicts racial quagmires and racial strife and racial war uh, in the last days. And we're seeing that now when we watch the news. Nation against nation. In the Greek there it's ethnos against uh, ethnos, ethnicity against ethnicity. Uh, race against race. And kingdom against kingdom. World War I, World War II. Now so that's the second thing that Jesus said is going to happen as he records it to us in Matthew 24. So it's Jesus, catch this, it's Jesus that's explaining the seals to us. Only he is worthy to unlock the seven-sealed scroll and reveal these things to us. Now, before we go on to the next seal, I want to say this also. Again, that our scriptures, believe it or not, from Genesis to Revelation, are that seven-sealed scroll that Jesus is revealing to the saints. I want you to go to, to Isaiah chapter 29, we have to remember that all these books in the Bible were written before they became one book. 
And so there's prophecies given that show that they were to become one book and that Jesus would, through the power of the Holy Spirit, begin to reveal the mysteries to us as we study the Word of God through the power and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go to Isaiah chapter 29, and I want you to read this interesting prophecy, which is a reference to the Holy Bible and the seven-sealed scroll, which is the Holy Bible. Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 11, in the 700 years of, of B.C. era, God showed the prophet Isaiah this. Again, Isaiah 29, verse 11. For you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say to him, read this, please, he will answer, I cannot, it is sealed. Verse 11 there says that you can give this scroll to somebody that's educated, but if they don't have the Holy Spirit, remember, only Jesus can open the scroll. Only Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can reveal it to us. So it doesn't matter if they're educated. They'll still say, I can't, it's sealed. Verse 12, or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, read this, please, he will answer, I don't know how to read. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. But now watch this. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18, reading on, God promises a day that when this codified scripture, the Holy Bible, would be complete, that eventually it would be revealed. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18, In that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and out of darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Notice the last verse of Isaiah 24. Those who were wayward in spirit will gain understanding, and those who complain will learn doctrine, or understand or accept instruction. So there's coming a day that this, the words of this scroll, the Holy Scriptures, are to be unveiled or revealed to us. If we go to the Gospel of Luke, we find that Jesus began to, to unveil the seven-sealed scroll, the Holy Scriptures, to his apostles, even during his time. We read in Luke chapter 24 and verse 25, He, Jesus, said to them, his apostles, How foolish are you are, and how slow to, of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Verse 27 of Luke 24, notice carefully. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now notice that it's only Jesus who can properly unseal the scriptures for us. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Why could Jesus do that? Because no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it? Then one of the elders said to me, Revelation 5, 5, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seals. Now what's interesting is, starting from the book of generation, gen, uh, excuse me, starting from the, be, the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis, to the book of Revelation, there are seven dispensations of time, seven epochs of human growth, seven dispensations of time, where there was different covenants given and different things happening through those, those seven dispensations of time. So because the Bible records seven dispensations, the last one will be the millennial reign of Christ. And each one of those seven dispensations is introduced by a covenant. It shows that this is the seven-sealed mystery. When you begin to understand the seven dispensations and all the septenary mysteries of Scripture, Jesus is in fact unveiling the seven-sealed scroll to his church today. Back in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, we read this. He, Jesus, said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The Torah, the Ketuvim, and Nevi'im. Then, verse 44, Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Then he opened their minds 
so they could understand the scriptures. He unsealed it. Again, Luke chapter 24 and verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Only the Lamb of God can open up this seven-sealed scroll. Now we've covered the first two horses. The first one is the false Christ. The second one is war. The third one, Revelation 5, or excuse me, 6 and verse 5, When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage to the oil and the wine. He's, he's showing here that it will take a whole day's wage to buy the staples, a basic food that, you, that we live on. Then I heard him sound like a voice, a quart of wheat for a day's wage and three quarts of barley for a day's wage. And do not damage the oil and the wine. Why not damage the oil and the wine? Well, number one, only rich people owned, owned uh, oil and wine. And oil and wine is actually a reference to medicine. In other words, it's going to be such a bad time that they're going to need the oil and the wine. They're going to need the medicine to help them get through those days. Now, this is the third horse. And we know that in inflation and, and after war, there's severe inflation and other things going on that, that, that produces famine. So it's not just a famine produced by natural causes or by lack of rain or drought or things of this nature. But this is also a famine because of the second horse, the, the, the horse of war. Now again, we know that these horsemen are going to have one final ride when the Antichrist appears. There will be one final false religion, first horse, set up. There will be one final war, which will be the war of Armageddon, um, the red horse. And there will be one final famine, um, which will happen after Armageddon. And then when we get into the fourth horse, that's when death comes. Things are so bad that people start dying. It's a pale green horse. That's the fourth horse. And that's, that's going to be the aftermath of the final ride of this Antichrist. As he goes from horse to horse, riding, going forth, conquering and to conquer, thinking that he still will win. And those who have followed him, thinking also that they too somehow will win. The sad part of it is we know the end of the story. They don't win. And that's why we as Christians today are calling people into the kingdom of God by giving them the gospel message. Now we have to understand again, brothers and sisters, that title deeds were sealed. There was a sealed copy and an open copy. May I suggest to you that this is our open copy. And Jesus is revealing things out of it to his true saints that have eyes to see and ears to hear so that we can appropriately understand what's going on in our, our world. He wants us to. He placed it here for us. Jesus says, he who seeks finds, he who knocks, the door will be open. It's given to you freely. The revelations and understandings of this are given to you freely. All you have to do is make the decisions to look for them. In the minor prophet Habakkuk, we also find that God was going to seal things. In Habakkuk chapter 2, starting at verse 2, Then the Lord replied to Habakkuk the prophet, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. So it took two centuries after Apostle John for the Bible to even start to become codified. And then, even now, in the last days, we're starting to understand the unfolding of this scroll, the seventh seal scroll, as we learn new things. And May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again, fulfilling Bible prophecy, showing that the scroll, the scroll is still being unsealed. The scroll is still being taught. There's things that we still yet need to know. Write down the revelation, make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Habakkuk chapter 2, 
verses 2 and 3. We also know that in the, the book of Daniel, portions of the book of Daniel were to be sealed until these last days, which we are now understanding as the Lamb of God continues to unseal the seven-sealed scroll before our very eyes. We read in Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter of Daniel, when he received all these revelations, we read, we, we read that what the Lord said to Daniel in Revelation, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 9, he replied, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed. There it is. Sealed until the time of the end. Not the end of time, but the time of the end. In other words, right before the end, they will be revealed. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. Showing that there's portions of the Bible that are still sealed, but will be revealed to the church at the appropriate time. Now we read, in closing this, I want to read how these are being revealed to us. Apostle Paul explains to us how these are being revealed. We have to understand the Trinity and the person of the Holy Spirit. And those are other studies also to know how these, how this seven-sealed scroll of the Holy Scriptures is being unsealed for us, God's saints today, so that we're not left in the dark. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting at verse 13, Paul says, This is what we speak, that is, Christians. Not in words taught by us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them. They're still sealed to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. They're spiritually understood. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgments. Again, Apostle Paul here says, The man without the Spirit will not be able to comprehend the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually discerned. Now, having said that, I, will give, I want to give a message, an upcoming message on the four horsemen, but I wanted you to understand appropriately and thoroughly in a short form, this, I could give much more information on this, but I really want you to understand that, 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 that the Bible itself, brothers and sisters, is the seven-sealed scroll. Seven is a number of completion. And it's, it's sealed, but if you want to understand it, Jesus says, he who seeks finds, he who knocks, the door will be open. You have to allow Christ to be your Savior, you have to accept the gift of the Holy Spirit so that your eyes can see and so that your ears can hear. We here at uh, TSW, the Shepherd's Way and Nugget of Truth, will continue to show how Jesus himself unfolds and unravels this scroll to us and gives us meat in due season, understanding. He doesn't leave his children blind. We have the unsealed copy of that scroll. When Jesus opens that final perfect sealed copy in heaven, 